Thank you, Seth, and good morning. As you can tell, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Peter Lilback, who I think is uh, not a stranger to most of you. We're very familiar with Peter. He's been here, I don't know how many times, Peter, six, seven times, and uh, hopefully six or seven more times in the future, and we enjoy having him. But for some of those of you who uh, may be new to Believer's Chapel or visiting, uh, Dr. Lilback is president of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, the original campus, and uh, we were given a treat in uh, reviewing some of Dr. John Murray's thoughts on being in Christ this morning. He was one of the great professors of that institution. Uh, Dr. Lilback uh, is also professor of historical theology there, and he is a prolific writer. I can't go over all the books and articles that he's written, but he has written a definitive book on George Washington, a biography, a spiritual biography, and George Washington's Sacred Fire, which I think has probably brought a lot of... Uh, discussion among the scholars of George Washington on that subject. But uh, Peter's down here doing some research this week, and we thought, well, while he's here, we'll draft him into service and have him do some teaching and preaching. And he's done that teaching, and now we're very happy to hear him do some preaching. So, Peter, we're looking forward to it. It's a great joy to be with you this morning to open the Word of God and to uh, share from the Scriptures. I'd like you to turn with me in God's Word to Psalm 85 for our reading of Scripture today. Uh, you'll notice uh, that probably in your Bible it will have a heading such as, Revive Us Again. Undoubtedly, many of us feel there's a need for the church to be revived and restored. Please hear the reading of God's holy and infallible Word. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you are favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. May the Lord continue to teach us through his word for his glory. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we know that we sing the song rightly, I once was blind. And Lord, while that blindness to the gospel has been removed, still the clouded minds that we have in this fallen world keep us from seeing the truth of your glory unless your spirit dispels that sinfulness and unbelief and slowness to hear and to believe. Oh, Lord God, would your spirit come and speak to us by your word that you would fulfill your promise, that you would teach your people, that we would hear your voice, O good shepherd, and follow you alone, that your word would be indwelling in our hearts through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that by your mercy we would become living epistles known and read by all men, and therefore we would be salt and light in a darkened world. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us today so that we would truly worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, as we come to seek your teaching and your glory, we would seek to intercede for so many. 
Lord, we know that each who comes before you today comes with a heart that is bearing burdens that many times are known only to that one. O oh Lord, you who are the searcher of hearts, would you winnow out these things and show your mercy and grace. Lord, where each of us need conviction and repentance, would you graciously give us this gift that we might please you. Lord, where we are weighed down and we are burdened, may we remember that you are gentle and that your burden is light and that you'll give us rest to our souls. And Lord, as we seek to be a people who serve you and we sense our own unclean lips, would you purify us that we might speak to a culture that is in overt rebellion to your lordship, that makes jest of your word, that uses the name that's above every name only in cursing and swearing. Oh Lord, would you please help us to be your servants in this day. Give us strength to be bold, faithfulness to engage. Be with our children and our families. Be with this congregation. We pray for Believer's Chapel, for physical needs, spiritual needs, relational concerns, for financial provision, for direction of wisdom. Oh Lord, would you bless us as we seek to be your people this day, believing that you are at work in all things. We would trust you, even as our forefathers in faith have said, that not even a hair can fall from our head apart from it working it toward our salvation. Oh Lord, we pray now that you might then bless our nation. Would you bless the witness of the gospel to the ends of the earth? And Lord, we pray that you'd be pleased to meet with us today. We thank you for the joy of being among your people. Lord, we think of the many who do not even know your name, and here we are, inundated with the truth of your word, to be surrounded by those who've been touched by your grace. Lord, thank you. Please restore your people. Revive your people. And may the great gift of saving grace sweep through our land so that it might be even as we've read, your footsteps are visible marching down Main Street as well as the central aisle here at Believer's Chapel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll have a Thank you again for the great honor to be with uh, Believer's Chapel on this Lord's Day to share in the Word of God with you as we study and reflect on the truths of the great gift of God, His Word to His people. Today we're looking at a psalm that's entitled, Revive Us Again. I don't think I would have to argue long that most of us believe the church needs to be revived, to be restored to be renewed. We look at our culture where things that were once considered absolutely wrong are now celebrated as necessary virtues. We think about politics regardless of our politics where everybody has to have their politics worn on their lapel or their purse or their sweatshirt. There's no ability to just simply say, I still want to think you have to be part of a party. War is tearing the world apart. The war in Ukraine means that Russia's fertilizers can't make it to America. So our food prices have gone up in part. It means that there's food that once went to Africa that's not getting there, and there's famine. Not to mention all of the cost and carnage of life and material goods being destroyed. Inflation is breaking out. People who are trying to make payments are struggling with ballooning mortgages, with uh, grocery shelf prices. These are issues that cannot be solved easily. International tensions. We hear saber rattling from great powers like China and America wondering what will happen. We wonder, is our nation in decline? But even worse, we are aware that the church is in decline. Would there not seem to be an absolute need for revival? The history of revival is something that we could contemplate, and forgive me as a teacher of church history to put a little church history before you. We recognize that the Christian faith was born out of a revival. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and the gospel spread all over the world. Extraordinary. In the ancient church, the entire movement of suffering people brought down the great 
Roman Empire when the gospel reached all the way to the emperor. But then we had a long period where the gospel was seemingly lost, the medieval period that spanned a millennium. And then the Reformation came. Luther and Calvin, Zwingli, uh, Cranmer, the power of the Reformation, and then a decline. And then Woodfield came on the scene with Edwards. And then there seemed to be a decline. And then there was the great Welsh revival that swept over the earth and went to Korea that brought about the greatest missionary movement in the world. Do you realize that little subcontinent, uh, excuse me, sub-peninsula of Korea has almost as many missionaries as the entire United States, a revival that broke out and spread. We recognize that these revivals have come in history, but we find that they were even in the Old Testament. When Moses came on the scene for a while, when the plagues were there and the exodus occurred, there was an extraordinary breaking through, but there was a decline. And then Joshua came on the scene and there was conquest but then the ages of the judges. And then we look through the scriptures. There's the time of David and the glorious era of Solomon. And then decline. And we waited, and then there were kings like Hezekiah and Josiah that brought renewal. And then the exile. And then Ezra comes back, and there's the reading of the word and the building of the temple. And the dark years until Jesus comes. As we look at this, we recognize that in the Old Testament, the saints in the past also found themselves crying out, when will there be renewal? When will there be revival? When will there be restoration? And so we find in Psalm 85 that the sons of Korah were in just such a period of time. And they wrote a hymn for the choir master so that Israel would sing a song of crying out for revival, for renewal. We find in verse 4, Restore us again, O God. In verse 6, Will you not revive us again? This then is the beginning of our study. I'd like us to think together under these headings. First, the interim between revivals. Secondly, we want to consider the initiator of revival. Thirdly, we will consider the intercession for revival. Then, fourthly, instruction about revival. And then lastly, the impact of revival. So if you like alliteration, there's some eyes for you, okay? We'll start with the interim between revivals. It's clear that there was a need for a revival. We see in verse 4, restore us again. There had been a blessing in the past, and now it's gone. And so, where are they now? In the first three verses, they describe themselves as an in-between period, an interim period, where once there was a great blessing of God, and now it's not there, and they're hoping that God would return and bless the people. We describe it this way in the first three verses. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. All a reality, but all in the past tense. Something that was once known and now gone. What a glorious time this revival in the past must have been. You were favorable. That means grace, favor, God's unmerited favor showered on the land. You restored the fortunes. There was a time where there was difficulty and they were renewed. The culture was strong. How You forgave the iniquity of your people. The sinfulness of people were dealt with before a holy God by grace and forgiveness. In fact... It says, you covered all their sin. Real justification grace had come and cleansed the people. Salvation was the reality of the people. Verse 3, you withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. There's a wonderful theological word for this in the New Testament. He is the propitiation for our sins. Not only for our sins, but for the sins 
of all of God's people throughout the world. What does that mean? It means that God's wrath was quenched. God's holy judgment was appeased. His perfect right to judge had been satisfied. The Lord had provided a sacrifice, an intervention of grace. But that was all back then. Now, at this moment in time, the interim is the reality where God's indignation is real. Verse 4, put away your indignation toward us. Verse 5, the question, will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? It is an in-between time, an interim between revivals. If we think of the great revival of the Reformation of Luther and Calvin, this is a time of Wycliffe where no one even has the Word of God, and they're crying out. And Wycliffe says, well, maybe I can get the Bible into English so a few people can read it. I would suggest this is a period where we are. Once there was a great revival in America. We think of George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards. We call it the Great Awakening. Many historians have argued it was this movement in history that gave the possibility of the country we know to come into being. Back in those days, each of the colonies were distinct, many countries of their own. If you cross the boundary, you're, you're a stranger. What caused them to come together? Well, a common enemy certainly helped. But before that, there was a preacher that went through the land. And he said, I don't care if you're a Methodist, an Anglican, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Congregationalist, you must be born again. And the power of revival broke out, and they no longer asked, well, are you from Virginia? Are you from Pennsylvania? Are you from New England? They asked, are you born again? The spiritual renewal came together, and it galvanized the common experience of people. And by the way, George Whitfield was known as an open lawbreaker for Jesus because it was a law in England that you had to preach in a church building. And Whitfield said, I'm tired of people falling off the roof trying to listen through the window to my preaching. They're crowding in. We're going out into the field. It was illegal. He said, it doesn't matter. I'm honoring the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so Whitfield established the right to appeal to heaven for what was right in spite of an earthly king. Some have called Whitfield the forgotten founding father of America, uniting the people and drawing them to the king above all kings. Well, we are in an age, not of Whitfield, we're in the age of John Bunyan. Remember the man who's in prison because he was trying to be a believer and it was illegal? That's the era we're living in. We're in, in a period of an interim. We're in the era of Wycliffe, not of Luther, the era of Bunyan, not of Whitfield. Can I say it this way? The era of Machen rather than the era of Billy Graham and John Stott and J.I. Packer and James Kennedy and Bill Bright and Jerry Falwell. Today with the name Falwell, that's a mockery word. Once he was on the cover of Time magazine as, who is this guy that's shaping America to want to have a Christian sense of what's right? Today the name Falwell is one of disgrace and shame. Oh, we're in an interim period. Once there was favor, restoration, forgiveness, covering of sin, withdrawing of wrath, propitiation, and today we are wondering, is the church going to survive? Well, in this interim period, we need to understand who is the initiator of revival. Well, it's quite clear as we read the psalm in verse 4, restore us again, O God of our salvation. Verse 6, will you not revive us again? Revival is the direct work of God in history. It's not something we can manufacture. And so there's a clear difference between the first great awakening of George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and the second great awakening constructed by a man by name Finney. Finney was 
someone who came to a Christian understanding, and he said, you know what? We can create revival. We just need to know the right techniques. So the way we do it is we get people together for a big rally, and we call them out by name. We keep singing songs, and we can't leave till the somebody comes forward. And we make all sorts of emotional appeals, and we hold them in town to town and make them come to faith. Well, that, if you will, is a revival that comes from man. The revival that the Bible speaks about is one where we have to go on our knees and say, Oh, Lord, will you be angry forever? Oh, Lord, would you send your revival? Oh, Lord, you are sovereign in your grace, and only you can give life to the dead. Revival is initiated by the sovereign God of the universe, this was the theology of Whitfield and Edwards. God is sovereign and he grants it to his people. It is time. In his way, it is divine monergism, God's single action in history to accomplish salvation. It's sovereign grace. But that does not deny our responsibility. Most of us do not think of ourselves as evangelists, but 2 Timothy 4 or 5 tells us, do the work of evangelism. The denomination that I serve in is called the Presbyterian Church in America. It was started by a passion to reach people for Christ. It launched a major global mission movement. Our, one of our most visible people was someone you probably know, Francis Schaeffer, a man who wanted everyone to know the gospel and to think Christianly. My heart grieved when I learned just a few years ago that evangelism growth and the PCA was essentially zero. And yet this was the denomination that gave us James Kennedy, who did evangelism explosion all over the world. What happened? As one of my friends in Indonesia, an evangelist who is an evangelist, says, the church that stops evangelizing is committing suicide. God is sovereign, but we are always responsible. Do the work of an evangelist, even if you're not an evangelist. When I heard that statistic, I said, what will I do? I'm leading a seminary training pastors. Are we doing enough to teach them about the need to reach the lost? And so one of the things I realized, if we are willing to call ourselves reformed in some way, believing in the sovereignty of God, the word reformed means reformed according to the word of God. We want to follow the scriptures. And so I came across that wonderful work of the Pocket Testament League. It's just one of different ministries that allows you to take the Gospel of John, kind of personalize it. We printed them for Westminster, and I sent them out to my students during the COVID diaspora. We continue to do on campus, said, put one in your pocket every day and pray, Lord, let me cross someone's path today who needs to hear about Jesus and say, man, you need some good news. I sure do. Well, guess what? This is the good news according to John. Please read this. It has the blessing of God upon it. It's helped change my life in every way. I don't want to convict anybody. Only the Holy Spirit can. But may I humbly ask, when was the last time you cared about someone who's lost around you. How are you reaching out? God initiates this revival, but it does not negate our role. And so what we see is that we have a responsibility, which is it begins with intercession. We see this in verses 4 through 7. If we're going to say, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you when you bring back the joy of your work? What is our part? What do we do? Well, this is basically in this intercession from verses 4 through 7. This is the prayer for revival. Are we praying this prayer? Restore us again, O God of our salvation. Only God can do it. He's the initiator. But we have a role, and our role is intercession. Lord, would you put away your indignation toward us? Your anger and wrath is felt in our nation, in our houses, in our life. 
Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Lord, are we going to lose our children, our grandchildren, and our great children? Lord, will you restore them? Verse 6, will you not revive us again? Will you not bring the resurrection life of the gospel in our midst that your joy may be in us, that your people may rejoice in you? Verse 7, show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. In your prayer list, is there even a mention of the revival of the church, of the revival of our nation, of the revival of your family, of the revival of your witness in the workplace? Intercession. We are in an interim between revivals. We know that God is the initiator of true revival. But our responsibility means we have a role. And that first responsibility is an intercessory role of praying that God would revive us again. But we have another important role, and that is we need to be properly instructed for God's revival. We find this as we look again at verse 8 and following It says, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. It's often said, there is a famine of the word of God in the land. Go to church after church, and you'll hear many a wonderful story from the pulpit. You'll hear clever ideas conveyed or personal opinions. But where is the exposition of Scripture? Oh, my brothers and sisters at Believer's Chapel, Do not grow weary in the teaching of God's Word. Don't become like the Canaanites who seem to be so powerful. They have no truth if they've turned away from the Bible. It is the Word of God that alone gives us life. Those that are crying out for revival understood that they must not only pray, but they must hear God's Word. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. It is the word of God coming in might and power that is always at the core of revival along with faithful prayer and the word. You might say, that doesn't sound like a very powerful program, praying and studying the Bible. Well, theologians have called this the ordinary means of grace. The things that you do because God has ordained them. You know, when football teams start losing, do you know what a good coach does? Okay, we've got to get back to blocking and tackling. Are we doing it right? This is our blocking and tackling. It is praying and it's studying the Word. It's being faithful in the Scriptures that will take us into the revival era that we're looking for. So you might say, does the Word of God really have that power? I was just with one of my pastoral friends. I came to you from Philadelphia by way of Fort Myers, Florida, to Dallas. So I'm on a round-robin trip here. And as we were sharing some stories, uh, my pastor friend told me about one of the ministries he supports. It's in one of the uh, closed countries of the world where the Taliban have had their presence. Someone had the courage to give a Bible. And the Bible was torn in pieces by the Taliban. We won't have this kind of garbage in our land. And one of the Taliban warriors came along, and there's this little piece of litter on the ground. It had words on it. He picked it up, and it said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. This is a piece of litter, abused litter. He had just come from a village where he chopped off an arm and cut off a tongue. He's feeling kind of guilty, but he said, Well, you got to do this for Allah. Blessed are the peacemakers, and they'll inherit the earth. What is this? And wouldn't you know it, he stumbled on a Christian. He said, have you ever seen this before? He was afraid. He said, I found this on the ground. He said, okay, let me tell you about the Prince of Peace. And the Taliban warrior became a Christian and is now evangelizing at the risk of his life by just a simple scrap of paper that the Spirit blew by the Word of God in the wind of the earth to an elect person. Do not grow weary of studying the Word of God. Why? Because this is how God speaks. And what does He speak? 
He speaks peace to his people. Blessed are the peacemakers. He's the prince of peace. My peace I give to you, the peace the world can never understand. Ah, but this is the problem, oh friends, those of us who are listening to the word of God, who know the peace of God, we've been justified by faith and we have peace with God. Have we turned back to our folly, as verse 8 says? But let them not turn back to folly. Oh, the great revival of David brought in the golden era of Solomon. Solomon gave us the Proverbs filled with wisdom. And he ended his life as a fool. Are we turning away from the truth of God's word? Let us not sin that grace may abound. God forbid. The grace of the gospel given to us freely in the word of God calls us not only to study the word, but also as part of our responsibility to be faithful in repentance. It's quite remarkable when Luther unwittingly launched the great revival, the Protestant Reformation. He did it with the 95 theses put on the church door. And do you know what the very first one was? When our Lord Jesus Christ said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he did not say, do penance. But the Christian life is a life of daily repentance. Daily turning from sin to please God. So part of our responsibility, part of our instruction for revival is one, not only must we intercede, but hear the instruction of the scriptures, which is hear the word of God and then repent as it comes to your heart. What must we repent of? You can't say, well, that's what other people need. No, Luther was right. It is a daily reality. I compare it often to driving a car. You don't say, I'm glad I missed that car. I don't have to turn my steering wheel ever again. Oh, I'm going to turn back. Our daily life is trying to make sure we're staying on the path before us in the Word of God. The instruction in revival requires faithfulness to the Word, daily repentance in light of the Word as we intercede for God to do what only God can do. But notice further as we continue on, it also describes in verse 9 another element of what God is calling us to do. It says, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. In other words, that when we are doing our responsible part, we are not only studying the word, repenting daily, but we're longing for the salvation of sinners in our midst so that we might see God's glory break out. Stop and think about the glorious moments in the kingdom of God. It's when hardened sinners like Saul of Tarsus come to faith and the world says, how could it be? In my day, it was when the Watergate criminal Chuck Colson became a believer. How could it be? Chuck Colson, the hatchet man for Nixon, is now a gospel preacher. He was saved in prison. How could... Glory fills the land. When was the last time we heard the story that the gospel is broken out and sinners are renewed? That should be part of our experience when we begin to witness for the Lord. It was a beautiful thing at our last board meeting at Westminster. We were at a lovely spot not too far from the seminary where we met. And the first time I can remember, we were seated around one big table. It was like a big family table for dinner. We had nothing else except to just fellowship for the night. And while we were having dinner, I said, when, when the meal is about halfway done, I'm going to ask each of us to stand up and tell the story of how you came to faith. When was the last time you were in a gospel gathering where you just said, how did Jesus touch your life? Well, we did that. It was extraordinary. You got to realize this is Westminster Seminary. These are world-class Christian leaders. These are people who make decisions that touch things on the other side of the world. They're people who are raising funds with seven figures or more to make things happen. It's amazing. And I heard it again and again. 
I was from a pagan family three generations ago, and some lady, I don't even know, found my mother who was ready to divorce my grandfather and told her about Jesus, and she was changed, and she evangelized everybody in her family. And here I am serving the Lord today because of three generations ago, some unknown woman reached my grandmother, and she witnessed to the family. Could be the grandfather, could be the father, could be the brother. An unknown person sharing the gospel. Do any of you know who shared the gospel with Billy Sunday or Billy Graham or John Calvin? We don't even know their names, but because they were faithful and longed for salvation, they sparked something that changed history. When you share the gospel, it may not take root right now. Sometimes we get discouraged and said, yeah, I share it. No one ever believes one of the most beautiful things that ever happens is about every 30 years, it rains in Death Valley. You know where Death Valley is? The lowest hot place in the West? Nothing can grow there. But suddenly it rains and guess what's happened? For the next week there are beautiful flowers as far as you can see. The seeds have sat there for 30 years until the water of life comes and it brings great renewal. The question is not, do we see what we want in fruit? The question is, are we faithful to do what God has equipped us and called us to do, which is to lift the name of Jesus above everything? Psalm 138 says, you have set your word and your name above everything. When we lift up the name of Christ, we are touching eternity. We are touching the change points of history. We don't know when, but God is above time. God is saying, are you willing to hear the instruction about what brings revival? You need to begin by recognizing it's with the Word of God, with daily personal repentance, and then humbly sowing the seed. He that sows little will reap little. He that sows greatly will sow greatly, will reap greatly from their work. Well, we must conclude as we're coming to the end of this marvelous psalm, which I would humbly submit to you as God's paradigm for revival. It's been in the scriptures for, what, I guess 3,000 years. We didn't need Finney to tell us how to have a revival. It's been right here. This is how God has given it to us. Well, if we have seen then that we're in interim between revivals, we've learned that God is the initiator of revival. We've realized then that we need to intercede for revival, that we need to instruct properly about revival, which is the Word of God, repentance, an evangelistic witness to the lost for salvation. Then this is what brings the impact of revival. When revival comes, it's unmistakable. I love the story that almost Christian, as far as I can tell, Benjamin Franklin says in his autobiography, said that great George Whitfield came to Philadelphia more than once, and Whit Whitfield's preaching was so powerful that Franklin decided he never again would bring his purse to hear Whitfield preach, because when the altar call came at the end, he would, with the offering, put all his gold coins in. Wouldn't give Jesus his heart, but he gave him all his gold. He said, I'll never bring my purse to hear Whitfield preach again, because I always go home poor. He also said when he heard Whitfield preach, and when Whitfield left, he could walk through the streets of Philadelphia at night, and he could not find a block where he did not hear the psalms being sung in homes as people were worshiping the living God. The gospel grace had swept through, and he said, I could hear it everywhere. Revival is unmistakable. You don't ask, you think it's revival? It is. You see God's work. And so if we want to see the impact of revival, here's the description of it in verses 10 through 13. It says, Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. We'll pause there and just meditate on those two verses. Steadfast love, chesed, the faithful, unchanging, loyal love of God is manifest. And faithfulness, God who is absolutely trustworthy, they meet together. 
And it's as if the love of God, who's absolutely faithful, is granting faith to people who become faithful. They begin to live in faith to the God of love. God's love is met with saving faith. Righteousness, the holy nature of God, comes and brings peace to the soul. We're justified by faith and have peace with God. I love these words. They kiss each other. I love to do those weddings when you get to the point, you may kiss your bride. This is revival. Righteousness and peace are kissing. The wedding of heaven and earth have come. The covenant of grace is being restored. Fellowship of God and man and his church are evident to the world. Righteousness. Do you remember Luther as the medieval monk, student of the Bible? He's studying Romans, and he was coming to Romans 1, 16 and 17. He said, I hated the righteousness of God. I hated it. Because all he could think of is that final day of judgment where only the perfectly righteous would get to heaven. And he knew he would be judged. He said, I don't want to study this passage. I hate the word righteousness. This is right in his own writings. And then he said, as I meditated, I went on to read, but there's a righteousness that's from God, from faith to faith. He said, righteousness through faith? He said, suddenly was as if heaven opened up and I was altogether born again. And Luther said, I love this word righteousness, justified by faith because I had peace with God. Where he was the troubled medieval monk, he now had peace with the Almighty God because righteousness and peace kissed each other in a revival that still is being felt in different ways broke loose. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Faithfulness and righteousness meet when revival comes. Just like the crops are faithfully growing when the rain comes down, the image is God's grace is raining down and the faithfulness of the gospel seed rises up. It's evident. The impact is there. I love it in verses 12 and 13. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. We need to pause over the word yes. Hopefully that will trigger in your mind the great truth of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 22. Remember what it says? All of the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. Paul says whenever you see the yes or the amen, look for Jesus. He's right there. Because all of them are found in him. This is how revival comes. Jesus comes through the grace of God. The righteous nature of God is fulfilled in Christ. The faithful love of God is fulfilled in Christ. Faith is granted to sinners, and they receive this righteousness, and they're at peace with God because Jesus has come. Yes, the I am is the... Lord Jesus Christ, he will give what is good. In this interim of revival, are you prepared to believe that God will give this good gift? There's no reason that revival can't come again, except that we don't believe it, and we will not participate. Now, Wycliffe didn't get to see it right away. It had to wait till Jan Hus, and Jan Hus didn't get to see it right away. But because of their faithfulness in the interim, the day came when the great revival fires broke out. Do we believe that God can bring us an awakening, a revival, a restoration? In Jesus Christ, it says, yes. The Lord will give what is good. That's why we don't lose hope, because this is God's work. And he's given us the paradigm for what we pray for, what we teach about, what we seek. And our land will yield its increase. Well, that's the harvest. This, of course, is the harvest of the gospel. Didn't Jesus say, look unto the field, it's already white to harvest. Souls will come. Revival will come when we begin to share the good news. Righteousness will go before him. The God of righteousness touching people's lives is going to make a way. And I love how it concludes, and make his footsteps away. It says when revival comes you can see the footprints of God. 
Now, I know you don't like to see a lot of snow down here in Dallas. You get a lot of ice storms, I do know that. I remember them from years ago. But up where I come from, we get a, we get a, a fair amount of snow from time to time. And it's always fun to be the first person to walk through a snow field. I like to hike. I hike sometimes in the winter. And I walk through and I make the first path. Sometimes I turn around and I'm the second path coming back. And then I go down that trail a week later and guess what? My footsteps are totally gone. There's still snow on the ground, but now there's a path where other people said, oh, that must be a good way to go. I'm going to follow in it. When God comes through Christ with his yes and amen, and begins to bring the gospel, and believers are doing their work. The footpath of God comes, and it creates a way, a road. It is the highway of holiness. It's the ancient paths. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. Today, this God of the Scriptures has now walked right down the aisle here, Believer's Chapel. And Jesus is asking you to walk with him by putting your saving faith in him and then saying, Lord, we're in between a revival, but we know you can create it. And so we are praying for it. We are going to teach about it and repent about it and evangelize about it, believing, Lord, that you are going to grant this that you can give because you said yes, and every yes is yes in Christ because it's for his glory. We want glory to dwell in this land. New believers to filling our congregation, people hearing the good news. And, Lord, we want that footsteps to go not only right through our church, but right through our homes so that unbelievers like Benjamin Franklin will walk by and say, Jesus has been here. We can hear him. We can see him. We know his word. God, help us to that end. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time of studying your word. We ask that you teach us by your grace. For you, to you be the glory. And Lord, would you use us according to your sovereign plan to bring forth the revival that only you can bring. Oh Lord, how we need this touch of grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude <clears throat> our singing by turning to number 47 in your songs of praise. And so let's rise together and we'll conclude with singing number 40. As we conclude, I'd like to just share a passage from a great revivalist, George Whitfield, as our benediction. Would you receive these words in your heart? Whitfield, in preaching, said, did the Father say, this is my beloved Son, hear him? Then let every one of our hearts echo to this testimony given of Christ. This is my beloved Savior. Did God so love the world as to send his only begotten Son, his well-beloved Son, to preach to us? Then, my dear friends, hear him. What God said 1,700 years ago, immediately by a voice from heaven concerning his son upon the mount, that same thing God says to you, immediately by his word, hear him. If you never heard him before, hear him now. Hear him so as to take him to be your prophet, priest, and your king. Hear him so as to take him to be your God and your all. Hear him today, you youth, while it's called today. Hear him now, lest God should cut you off before you have another invitation to hear him. Hear him, ye old and gray-headed. Hear him, ye that have one foot in the grave. Hear him, I say, and if you are dull of hearing, beg of God to open the ears of your hearts and your blind eyes. Beg of God that you may have an enlarged and a believing heart, and that you may know that the Lord God saith concerning you. God will resent it. He will avenge himself on his adversaries if you do not hear a blessed Savior. He is God's son. He is God's beloved son. He came upon a great errand, even to shed his precious blood for sinners. He came to cleanse you from all sin and to save you with an everlasting salvation. You who have heard him, hear him again. Still go on, believe in and obey him. And by and by you shall hear him saying, Come ye blessed of my father. Receive the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen.